Hey friends, welcome to the All Means All podcast, a podcast of Cathedral of the Rockies, Boise First United Methodist Church. You found us, so we're glad you found us. And we just wanna remind you that you, you matter to us and you matter to God. We're in a series in the book of Acts. The book of Acts comes after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. It's really the birth of the church. And in the book of Acts, there's a sense where the Spirit's calling people to go to places they don't really want to go and to do things they don't really do, want to do and empowering them in a way they weren't really expecting. So maybe you're saying, maybe do I want to be led by the Spirit? Well, today is an interesting story because Jesus told us to love our enemies. Can you really do that? In the story today, an enemy becomes a friend. Let's worship together. Good morning, church. Good morning. Every now and then the pastor turns off the mic and looks back at the booth and they're like, it's you, ding dong. (laughs) Right? It's like the morning the pastor began and said, um... God is with you, and the congregation responded, also with you, but the mic wasn't working, and he said, I think something's wrong, and they said, and also with you. <laughs> well, we're going to continue our journey in the book of Acts, and today it's about, can we really, can we really love an enemy? I mean, this is one of those great bumper stickers of the Christian faith, love your enemy, but it's one of those really unpractical, hard things to do. How do you love an enemy? It was 1994 when Yitzhak Rabin, the former prime minister of Israel, won the Nobel Peace Prize and he shared it with his political rival, Shimon Peres, and also with the Palestinian leader, Yasser Arafat. It was one of those Middle East moments we long for when folks who seem to be enemies come together and go, we can live in peace. All of this was just too much for some people in Itzhak Rabin's own family, in his own tribe, in his own religious faith of Judaism. There was a Torah student named, named Yagil Amir. He loved God. He prayed daily. He studied the scripture, but when he read of this peace accord of enemies becoming friends, it was too much. And so he took it upon himself to assassinate Yitzhak Rabin in 1994. You know, if you get nothing else today, I want you to get this. We can't love God by hating others. It seems pretty simple, doesn't it? We can't love God and hate others. And yet that's one of the challenges of faith. Jesus tries to teach us this when he's teaching the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. He gives us those beautiful words, the first part of Matthew, blessed, blessed are you when when people are against you, blessed are you when you're hungry and thirst for righteousness, blessed are you. He keeps pronouncing, look, God is with you in unexpected ways. And he says, because of that, be live differently, be salt that flavors the world with God, bring out the light colors of the world. And then he says in Matthew chapter five and verse 43, Let's put it up. Read this with me. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. This is really hard to do. How do we let our enemies bring out the best. I mean, you can think right now, you might say, oh, I don't have any enemies. Okay, we're in church. (laughs) Who are those people, if they're not your enemy, those people that push your button? Now you've got some names in your head, right? They may be political, they may be neighbors, they may be actually sitting right beside you. Those people that push your buttons. How do you love them? How do you honor them? How do you care for them? Jesus unpacks this a little further in the next part. Let's go to the next slide. He says, when someone gives you a hard time, respond with the subtle moves of prayer. Can you imagine? And it's not, just to be clear, it's not, 
God get them? That is not the prayer, right? It is God use me to love my enemy. I mean, he goes on to say, then you're working out of your true selves, your God created self. This is what God does, he writes. God gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner can do that. Christianity for us, whether you're new or been in Christianity your whole life, it's learn to see it as a way of discovery. It's not a set of rules to believe. It's not a set of doctrines to understand. It's a way of discovering God's love through the grace, love, mercy, justice, and forgiveness of Jesus. It's a way of understanding just when I think I understand God, God's love gets bigger and God draws the circle bigger. He not only says love your enemy, but he shows me how to love my enemy. So we've been in the book of the the Acts of the Apostles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts. The Acts of the Apostles is a story of the church. It's our story. It's how God works with us and through us. It's the story of us learning a new way. We ask for power, we want power over, and God says, I'll give you power, but it's power to understand. We learn to be community, to share with each other. We learn to include people we used to exclude. And today we learn to love an enemy. The enemy has a name, Saul. Saul is a a man of faith. He's he's a, a prayer. He's one who studies the law so much. He loves God so much, he studies the law. He wants to make sure he's living the law faithfully. We meet him early in chapter seven when Stephen, one of those people that was in last week's text, was chosen to be a leader in the new church. And Stephen speaks out for Jesus and folks do not like his message. And they decide to murder him, to to communally murder him as they stone him and Paul is there, Saul is there. Saul and Paul, it's the same guy, it's just a different understanding of his name. He uses sometimes his Gentile name more than he uses his Roman name. And so sometimes, depending which crowd he's in, he says, they'll understand me more if they understand my name. So he's there in the crowd when they come to stone Stephen, and he approves, they lay their coats at his feet, and he watches as they stone Stephen. He probably cheers them on and thinks, Yeah, God is being glorified. You can't hate others and love God. You can't celebrate someone else's demise and love God. Luke introduces us to to Saul, and he reminds us he's a violent persecutor of the people of the way, that he begins destroying the church, going from house to house, it says in Acts chapter 8, dragging off men and women, taking them to prison. And then he shares this in Acts chapter 9. All this time, he writes, Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples, out for the kill. He went to the chief priests and he got arrest warrants to take to the meeting places in Damascus. So if he found anyone, anyone there belonging to the way, that's the church, the way, the way of Jesus, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. Now this is a guy that's passionate about his faith in a way that's not helpful for us. He's a zealot in his faith. And yet he will go on to write two thirds of the New Testament. This guy who's witnessing and participating in the murder of Christians will one day write to the church in Corinth, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it is not boastful or proud, it is not self-seeking, it is not rude. He'll go on to write, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This guy who writes love never fails is right now trying to figure out how to get you and me arrested. How to get us thrown in prison for our faith. I mean, the same guy, he will one day write to the church in Galatia, in Christ's family, there's no division. 
neither Jew or Gentile, neither Jew or non-Jew, slave or free, male or female, among you we are all equal, we are one in Christ. Here's what we know, because the scripture tells us he's a Pharisee. A Pharisee, sometimes we hear in the Christian church as if, if it was a melodrama, we think, oh, we should boo and hiss. Like he's a Pharisee, he's the bad guy. No, no, when you hear he's a Pharisee, you should hear, here's someone who's devoted their life to understanding God and living the law. They're reading the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're living the, the law. They believe the Torah is the way to God. It's the way to understand God. And anybody who goes beyond the Torah is against God. He's been taught in Jerusalem by a great rabbi, by Gamel. And that means Gamel chose him as a pupil. The only way you got taught was when the rabbi said, I want you in my class. I want you in my class. And, he, and the rabbis would pick who was in the class. And so he was taught the ways of God by Gamel. He would have been a person of prayer. He would have prayed daily at least three times a day, which was the tradition of the day. He'd have prayed the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Shema, Israel, Adonai, Elohu, Adonai, Echad. He would have prayed it daily. He'd have believed it. God is one. But he's out to kill and to arrest people who don't believe like he does. We can't love God by hating others. Chapter 9 begins, and it said that Saul was breathing down the necks of the people, master's disciples. He got arrest warrants to go to Damascus. If he found anyone, he would have them arrested. So he travels 136 miles north from Jerusalem to Damascus. I mean, this is, and you got to remember this, this is no Uber, right? This is probably a journey on foot. So he's intentional about traveling all the way up north to Damascus, modern-day Syria, to get rid of Jesus' followers. Acts 9, it says he set off. And when he arrived in the outskirts of Damascus, he was suddenly experiencing a dazzling bright flash of light. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If God met you today on the road home, and a dazzling light appeared and you had to pull off to the side because you couldn't see and it was God speaking to you, what question would God ask you today? Would God ask you, why is it you don't live your faith? You post that you're a believer but you don't live your, would God ask you, why don't you understand you've been gifted to make a different world? Would God ask you, why don't you understand you've been forgiven? What would God ask you today if God stopped you along the road? Saul, why do you persecute me when we exclude others? We persecute God. Saul responds, who is this, Lord? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Why do you persecute me? Could it be that we can be so faithful, so in love with God, so hungering to be God's people that we totally miss the message of God? Why do you persecute me? This is not just a story of transformation, but it's a story of call, it's a story of vocation. Saul's not alone when this takes place. If you read the story, because sometimes you read a story like that and think, sure you heard a voice. You know, sure you did. There's others traveling with Saul, and it says they heard the voice, they did not see the vision. And so transformation's beginning to take place in Saul, and those traveling with him know something's up, but they don't get the whole story. And sometimes that's how transformation happens in us. God's working with us, God's moving with us, God's calling us, we're feeling it internally, we're dealing with it, and sometimes those traveling with us know something's up, but they don't see the whole story yet. Saul, this one, this persecutor of the faith, is now blind. There's an interesting image. He goes from carrying warrants for people's arrest to saying, can somebody help me continue the journey? And they take him by the hand. 
like you would a child. They take him by the hand and they lead him in to Damascus where for three days he prays and he fasts, he doesn't eat and he waits. What does this mean for me? Sister Franciscan sister Ilia Delio writes, to follow Jesus is to be a whole maker. Are the people you encounter made whole because they're with you? Or do they encounter your faith as a faith that divides? Saul's theology has no room for others, only for people just like him. Ananias is the next person we meet in the story. And it's in chapter 9, verse 10, when God speaks again. It says, a disciple named Ananias was in Damascus, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord. The Lord said, rise, go to Straight Street and inquire at Judah's house for someone named Saul of Tarsus. He's praying. He's seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming and putting his hands on him so that he may see again. So we got two calls. We got a call within a call story. Saul's been knocked to his feet. He's been led to town. He's waiting. He's blinded. He's listening. And now you get a guy named Ananias who's a follower of Jesus. And he's asked, will you love the enemy? So think of one of those people that pushes your buttons, one of those people that just brings sometimes the worst out in you. And there, there are some of those people in my life. I hate that. I hate that I still give certain people power because we disagree on things. And sometimes I have to back up and go, why am I, why am I giving that person so much power to frustrate? And why can't I enter that conversation with love? Why am I zero to 100? Think of that person. God says, I want you to go visit them and I want you to lay hands on them. And you might think, oh yeah, I can do that. No, I want you to lay hands on them and pray for them and heal them. Ananias does what you or I would do. He kind of reminds God who Saul is. He goes, "Um, have you read the tweets? Do you understand he's got an arrest warrant for someone like me? Just in case you miss this God, do you understand he's bad? And here's the response for God. This is Acts chapter nine, verse 15. Go. That sounds like our parents. Sometimes we make it all the, here's why I can't do that. I can't get out, and they go, go. Go. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, their kings and the people of Israel. And now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with this job. Go. So Ananias goes to the enemy. I I always love the fact that it's, and it's Judas's house. It's not the same Judas of the scripture who's a disciple who betrays Jesus, but there's a little hint in there of this is not a place you wanna go. Go to Judas's house on Straight Street. He knocks on the door, they open the door, he goes to Saul and he greets him with the word, Brother Saul. I mean, immediately he says, you're my sibling. We're on different sides of this conversation, but you're still my sibling. It's a reminder that everyone you meet is made in the image of God. Everyone you meet. You go, not, not hurt, not hit. Everyone you meet is made in the image of God. Brother Saul, Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the way, has sent me to you that you may see again, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He touches him, and, and something like scales falls from his eyes, and he can see, and he, he stands, and immediately he has to be baptized, and he's baptized. He's included in the family of faith. Jesus' love transforms an enemy into a sibling. Wow. You can't love God and hate people. Here are the action steps. We're going to continue in the book of Acts next week, and we're going to look at chapter 10. And it's another way where God pushes now an insider in the faith to say, can you include some things that you think are outside your faith as holy? And it's hard to change our religious beliefs. 
Next week will be, is your religion open to expanding? Or is your mind open to seeing God in new ways? Second, I encourage you to connect with two people. And I say that because two people, I'd say, you know, you can start even in here after service as you get a coffee, as you walk around, as you head out. Just say, hey, say, introduce yourself. Get to know somebody. Why? Because people will stay in church when they connect with each other. When they connect with a friend, when you get a name, and you might even say to somebody, hey, I think you were sitting behind me. Why don't, you, could we, why don't we sit together next week? Come sit with us. Be fun to sing together. Be fun to, you know, why? Because together we're better. And so I encourage you to, what's it take to invest in someone else? I had somebody in the office the other day and they, they, they asked me this question. They said, Pastor Dwayne, this is your chance. Give me your Jesus speech. And I was like, oh, shoot. I do this for a living and I still, ha- I kind of stumbled through my words. And I kind of felt like, I don't, I, don't think I, I don't think I did a very good job with that. But I hope what they heard was God loves them God loves me, I'm continuing to grow in faith, they can continue to grow in faith, and we can do it together. You may stumble, you may feel awkward, I just encourage you, it's okay, when you connect with others, they connect with God. Just introduce yourself, welcome somebody, maybe it's even a friend at work next week, you say, come with me, we're studying this book of Acts, we're learning what it means to be the church. Here's the last one, be willing to love an enemy. That sounds like an action step that somebody would put out there and then you go, yeah, how, how do you do that? Be willing to love an enemy. So a couple weeks ago when I was in England, Paul Chilko was one of our, our professors in the class we were taking, and he told this story of his own life. He said when he was studi- studying at Duke uh, Divinity School, working on his doctorate, he said a famous theologian came to our campus. This is one of those, and, and of course, you know, those of us, and, and this world would nerd out. He said, Jürgen Moltmann came to our campus, famous German theologian. And he said, he went to lunch with us and I started to tell him about my doctoral thesis. And I said, hey, uh, Dr. Moltmann, I'm working with Frank Baker here at um, Dale Divinity, uh, at the Divinity School. And he said, can I tell you a story about Frank and his wife, Nellie Baker? Sure. He said, during World War II, Frank and Nellie Baker served a little Methodist church in Northern England, actually up in Scotland. It was near a German prison camp. Most of these prisoners, many of them had been caught in, in England after their planes were shot down. And you know, these were people who bombed our country. And he said, Frank and Nellie Baker came to that prison camp and they met the leader of the prison camp and they said, hey, look, we're, we're, we're Methodists. We're, I'm a pastor. We'd like to pick up a couple prisoners every Sunday and we'd like to take them to church where we can worship together, where we can have the sacrament together. And then we'd like to take them to our home and feed them a home-cooked meal and then we'll bring them back. And believe it or not, the leader of the prison camp said, sure. Maybe he thought, this is an island. They can't escape, you know. Sure. And so week after week, Frank and Nellie Baker loved the enemy by taking them to church, by sharing in communion, by having them to their dinner table. And as he told that story, he got to the end of the story and this world-famous theologian looked at my friend and said, one of those soldiers was a young man named Jürgen Moltmann. In other words, he said it was 17-year-old me who was loved by that Methodist couple, and I discovered hope. Jürgen Moltmann went on to write his, his biggest book probably is a, a, a theology of hope, but he went on to say, those who hope in Christ They can no longer put up with reality as it is, but they begin to suffer under it, to contradict it. Hope makes us ready to bear the cross of the present. Friends, we can't love God and hate others. We are called to a new way. Let's pray. Holy God, thanks for the privilege of gathering in this space, and thanks for the story of Saul 
It reminds us that we can never be far from your love. Even when we've been against you physically, when we, even when we've worked against you, God, you reach to us and say, don't you know that I love you? Why are you persecuting me? Make a turn, join me. Thank you for Saul. Thank you for Ananias, one in the family of faith, one of, one of the people of the way. Ananias, who's willing to love an enemy, even though his first response is, this can't be. He loves an enemy and says, brother Saul, God, teach us to live like that. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. <music> So glad you found the All Means All podcast. We are working on this new way. And I would just remind you, if you're part of the church through the podcast and you feel called to support us as part of the way you live your life and to help us to serve our community, you can always go to cathedralderockies.org. You can set up your automatic giving and you can be a consistent giver that helps us feed the hungry, helps us provide a place of worship, helps us get pizza to the kids when we give kids pizza on that Monday when they come back to school. It helps us be the church. I hope you'll consider joining us.